this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work again. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. So the pandemic has clearly affected the value of businesses big and small. But there's a way you can recapture a lot of that value if you think about your business through the lens of what an acquirer will care about. You know, as we grow our companies, oftentimes they become this sort of spaghetti ball of different products and services, but acquirers only care about what they could not replicate, what it would be difficult for them to redo or rebuild. And therefore, they're going to place a high priority on the products and services that you sell, which they deem to be truly differentiated. And that's why looking at your business through the lens of an acquirer can really be helpful in these situations where you're trying to rebuild. We can help you do it. Just go to valuebuilder.com. You can take a questionnaire that will help you look at your business through the lens of an acquirer. We can also connect with you with one of our certified value builders who can be a sounding board for you as you go through this process. Best of luck with the rebuild, the restart. Please go to valuebuilder.com to check out the resources there. Ever been to one of these fancy salad restaurants where you go in and you can order all kinds of different fixings and toppings for your salad? Well, when Anna Schaud moved to Portland, Oregon, she discovered that there were really no good salad options for people on the go. And so she started a restaurant called Garden Bar. And Garden Bar was a success. She had one location, she got to two, ultimately built it to nine locations. To finance her growth, she got some investors. And little did she know, along the way, she signed an agreement that had a ticking time bomb that was about to explode. It exploded at exactly the wrong time when she got an acquisition offer from one of Seattle's fastest growing salad bars, a company called Evergreens. I don't want to spoil the story. Here is Anna Schaud to tell you the rest. Anna Schaud, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. Thank you. Hi. It's so nice to be here today. Yeah, for sure. So tell me a little bit about this company, Garden Bar. What, what did you got? It's a restaurant, I guess. Yes. So uh, Garden it. Bar is a uh, chain of fast casual restaurants that specialize in salads only. So if you think about it, it's counter service. You walk in, the, you go down the line, you choose the ingredients, the products made in front of you, you pay, you go. So it's chip, I like to say Chipotle style. Uh, but we specialize in salads only. Our goal was to actually give, you know, people the option of a meal that was fast but healthy. And, and that's, that's what Garden Bar is. Um, and so how did you come up with the idea for this? Yeah, that is the question I get asked a lot. Uh, so what <laughs> happened was <laughs> um, – I've always been very much of a nutrition enthusiast. And as a matter of fact, um, I, I moved to Portland, Oregon in 2008 from San Francisco. And one of my goals was to become a nutritionist, right? So that was what I had in mind and I was going to do it. But then a year later, life happened and I, I got divorced. And so when that happened, my goals and dreams of becoming a nutritionist uh, were, had to be stopped. But I still wanted to be in the health world, in the health in the health industry. Can so, I ask you, what, what does divorce have to do with your choice of career? Oh, good question. Um, I had, well, what happened was, so going back to San Francisco, I had a consulting practice. And as a consultant, you, as you know, you're self-employed, you have clients, you have customers, you do all this stuff. But I let go of that consulting practice to move to Oregon. So I had no clients here in Oregon. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to rebrand and become a nutritionist. So I was not, I was not working as a consultant. I was going to school full time. Uh, when we got divorced, that that had to be paused because I had to go back to work full time. Because now um, financially, I needed to go back to support my kids, so I had to figure out a way to get myself in the in the in the workforce again. And, and you know, when you're a consultant, as much as you are, it was it was hard for me to find a client base here that was similar to what I had in California. So. I started out, I, I went back to business operations and I started out as a controller. 
And that first job I got that I got back right after the divorce, uh, it was it was a good job in in some respects, but it was a very very demanding job, and I only had half hour for lunch every day. So I I had I wasn't this health, and I was it was in diets, and, and at the time I was doing paleo, and I couldn't find a place that I could just go grab something fast and leave. So I found myself going to Chipotle a lot. And and I kid you not, I was having a saw at Chipotle every day. And all I could think is, can I just have more than six ingredients? I started getting really, really tired of it. So I started to look for a place that had solids in that format. And I was just very interested that Portland didn't have one. Um, Were you aware of some of the other sort of salad only concepts like Freshy was one? I'm not sure when they started. Did they start around that time or were they after you guys? Freshy, I don't know when they started, but they were not really a direct competitor. The direct competitors are like Sweet Green was a big much of a direct competitor and Chopped. Uh, they were mostly in the East Coast. And yes, the concept was widely popular in New York and Washington, D.C. And I was and I was very intrigued by the fact that we didn't have it in Portland. In San Francisco, which is where I had moved from, um, I was actually inspired. But there was a place called Pluto's that had something that started that way and then mixed uh, came in, became sort of the name brand in California for that concept. Hmm. So I was aware of that, but a little bit um, a, a little bit intrigued by the fact that nothing like that had happened in Portland yet. So the idea had come to me, but I kind of. I simmered on the idea for about a year and a half, uh, trying to get myself back on my feet after divorce, being able to, you know, be able to go back, work again. And then about a year and a half in, two years, uh, my ex-husband and I had an agreement that uh, we were going to figure out what to do with our house. And he ended up buying me out of the house and I got a little bit of money. And this is a true story. I thought I am going to open a business with this money. And, but I remember having dinner with my boys and my nine-year-old at the time sitting and eating like his Yoda style. And I said, he's like, are you going to buy a house? And I said, you know, I don't know. I'm either going to buy a house or I'm going to start a business. I'm not sure yet. And he said, well, if you start a business, you might be able to buy any house you ever want. And I thought, oh, wise words. I think it's what I'm going to do. So. I decided that I was going to use those funds to open the business. And I, the, the, the idea of Garden Bar came to me. I researched it. We had nothing in Portland. But I also, I was very aware that I had no restaurant experience. And so when you tell anyone about opening a restaurant, you know what the reaction is, right? Everybody just goes like, what? You know, they fail. And sure. I said, I know. So at the time, I, I met who was my co-founder. Uh, and he was in the restaurant world and he were, he was in the fine dining world and he had a couple of restaurants in Portland. So he and I got together and I said to him, Hey, I, I have this much money. Are you able to make it happen? And he said, I'll make it happen. So we did, we, we strategized over it. I, I, we had very clear delineation of duties. He was working on building the actual physical restaurant. I was working on the business and getting everything set up, the infrastructure, everything we needed to do. And then together we started and then we built our first location. How did you guys figure out the equity? Cause you were bringing cash to the table. Did, were you 50, 50 partners or did, did he bring cash as well? Or how did, no, how did he you did sort not. that out? At first we, it, and this is a little bit tricky cause there is a little bit of a settlement. Unfortunately we had to part ways after. So I can't really, you know, be extremely specific on numbers, but at first we had an arrangement, but, um, you know, restaurants need to be able to raise money, a convention and the anthony investors. So we had to figure out an equity distribution that would allow uh, for us to be able to go to banks. And so I ended up having a little more equity. He had some equity, but not 50-50. And so he had a bit of it and I had a little more. And because I was the one who was going to get the conventional financing and all that, and he had already 
a lot of conventional finance in his name so that wouldn't allow for him to join me in that journey of financing so we he did not bring any cash i brought the cash it wasn't a lot of cash but i did bring the cash and we started by creating that first location so the idea was we're going to create this prototype right and let's make sure that the, the city loves it and then it's that works and we decided to open i don't know if you know portland but there's an area called the pearl which is a very uh it's dense it's it's where you know things happen so a trendy we decided, yeah kind of the trendy area so we wanted yeah. to be in the pearl and we were uh, we found the location right across the street from Powell's Bookstore, which is a big landmark in our city. And that's where we started that first location. Um, what did yeah. you invest in that first location? Like how much cash did you inject yourself? Like what was the financing model? Yeah. So I self-funded that location completely and I, I spent $68,000. <laughs> it wasn't a lot. But you so also, right. I'm assuming you also sort of signed a lease and did you did. personally did have to sort of guarantee that? I personally guaranteed my 10 leases, if you want to know the truth. Um, wow. It was very hard. Even <laughs> after 10 locations, they don't let you off the hook. So that's important for everybody to know. Um, you have to have a huge appetite for risk, which I, I do. But uh, you just have to. So wait a minute. You, you personally guaranteed 10 leases? Correct. Yes. Oh my God. And I still have a few under my name, even after the sale. So it's important to put this out there. <laughs> so Anna, yes. I mean, that would be enough to, I'm assuming that would be enough to bankrupt you if it hadn't worked. Oh, a hundred like, times. Oh, oh, this, like many this, times this over, is, does not describe the potential for bankruptcy that I had throughout the entire journey. Yes. But you how know, did you reconcile that as the primary caregiver for your two boy, your boys? Your, I, yeah. I, I, what? You just do it. I, you, you, I knew, I knew that if I worked on this correctly and, and I knew that I could do it and I'm very, you know, I was a business consultant for 12 years in San Francisco. So I, am, I knew how to run a business, right? What I did not know is how to run restaurant. <laughs> but um, so what I did was from the get go, I, I was determined that I was going to run it like a business because restaurants have it they have their own way of operating sometimes that doesn't necessarily um, equate to efficiency or you know so a lot of times I knew restaurants do some things a certain way and I said well but let's try it this way and see if we can make this work better right so I I was really a uh, aware of the need for operational excellence. You, you, you have to be on top of it the whole time. So to answer your question on the first lease, yes, not only I personally guaranteed it, uh, but my, my actually my business partner at the time did too. The biggest issue for us was that we had no proof of concept. So we were describing this, you know, concept. And because the, this, this location was such a prime location, uh, it was interesting to try to convince our landlords that we could make this happen. So they, they really, they gave us a shot, but it wasn't the best terms on the lease. So I always say, you know, I just, I, I didn't have it. We just had to do what they asked us to do. So, we went with it. Um, we got the first store open, and it was an it was an immediate uh, success for the city. Like the city was so happy to get that concept. You know, it was immediately embraced, uh, and we started to realize that there was really a need for that concept in how, our. City. How profitable was that first store? Like on a you know, like how much were you? on a margin basis or like net after all your expenses, your food, your staff, like what were you clearing on that first door? John, do you know what the margins are for restaurants in general? <laughs> Very low. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> so this is why I'm going to preface with the reason why we had to scale is because you can never make it on one. Right. So restaurants have very low margins, very low margins. So we, we really, really, really shoot for 2 to 5%. If we can, if nothing goes wrong, if you're like, everything is great. But also, let me, let me say something like this. Garden Bar, we had no alcohol. 
right? Which for several restaurants, that can be something that augments your margins. Sure. We didn't have that. And also we have very expensive food quality. So if you go to a lot of different, uh, you know, chains, they may have good quality that's half of what our cost was. So we were a little, we were caught a little bit in a, between a rock and a hard place where we, I, I really was very particular about the food integrity, but that was, a, it was a very tough, tough, tough choice. Also with one store, you don't have economies of scale. So the idea is if you scale that business. Now, my lettuce provider is not providing for one store, they're providing for 10 stores. I'm able to negotiate prices a little better, right? So the idea of scale was, I knew about that from day one. And once I started looking at that business model and I spent hours looking at those projections and I'm thinking, I cannot make this work with one store. So with restaurants, we don't do, it's not so much the margin is your revenue growth. So if you think about our first store, we, we started the first year, we had the first little, it's a tiny little store. We had no kitchen, John. We ran an entire year with one induction oven and one electric oven and we made, and, and a Vitamix and every single dressing was made from scratch. Every meat was cooked from scratch. Everything was made by hand. And so the first year with a tiny little kitchen, no oven, a lot of calls from the fire department because the chickpeas would smoke. Um, uh -huh. I mean, I swear to God, it was like, so I would give solace to fire department and apologize every day. But um, yeah, so first year we had 500,000 in revenue. Second year we doubled and, and it's just wow. continued going from there. Um, so one year in, we decided that we needed a scale and we had no kitchen. So we found a location that was our location number two that was literally about six or seven blocks on location number one. And the reason why we did that is because it was a good location. It had a nice kitchen. We would be able to provide both stores. But what we discovered by having two locations close to each other was that that concept was not a destination concept. It was a convenience concept. And the bubbles didn't intersect. People wanted to go. It's like Starbucks. You go to the nearest to Starbucks that you have. So even if you have a Starbucks here and one, three blocks over, they don't compete for same customers. This is what we wanted to develop. So we worked on clustering the downtown Portland and setting territory. So we ended up having five locations in downtown Portland and they were all maybe 10 walking distance, 10 minutes from each other. But it was great because every garden bar had its own bubble and people would like, they didn't want to go farther than two, three blocks to eat a garden bar. But what it allowed them to do is go to garden bar three to four times a week. It became something that you would do regularly. Because these downtown hipsters sort of would spend most of their life in the downtown core. And no matter where they were downtown, they, you know, they weren't going to the suburbs to eat lunch. They were still Correct. kind of downtown. Yes, yes, Got exactly. Because the, the downtown uh, work, workforce likes to walk, you know, a radius of two, three blocks sure. max. But what we were trying to do is be close enough to, to create the habit that they would want to eat in gar a garden bar every single day. And so no matter what, where they are, there's one. No matter what they are. Yeah. So, and it was very successful. People really started to do, to do that, especially when we introduced our reusable containers where then people start feeling okay. Because every time you go out, if you have, you know, a, a disposable container, it started creating that little, the guilt piece. And then we ended up creating a, a reusable container program and that just our sales just went off the roof because people started to come back three to four times a week and they would just bring their container. We would give them a new one. It was, it was rewashed. So that was a very, very popular thing we did. Um, but so wait, I, I'm, a, I'm familiar with, so you had this reusable container. I'm familiar mm -hmm. with like Starbucks, you bring your own mug. So in mm -hmm. what way was yours similar or different than that? Like you just bring your own container and you would fill it up. Is that how it worked? No, because 
Oregon law does not allow you to use someone else's container. Starbucks, yes, but if you go to a restaurant and you try to bring your own container, you have to run through your own dishwasher. You cannot take someone else's container. It's against the law. So the way we did that is we purchased a ridiculous amount of reusable containers. They're like BPA free. I don't have one here, but I could show you. But they're BPA free containers and we would have them there and, and a, a guest they would pay that deposit, I say of ten dollars. And so when they place their order, which a lot of our orders were online or or in person, they would say, I would like that in a reusable container. We would give you the reusable container, you eat your salad. The next time you come to Garden Bar, you give me your dirty container and I'll give you a salad on a fresh new container. So yeah. you just keep bringing back your old container. I'll take it from you. I'll wash it and then we'll give you a fresh one. So that way oh. the containers were always, you know, they were like in the dishwasher and, but you would feel, you wouldn't feel guilty of having to order that um, every day. And so some people, we got a lot of, of feedback from guests. So they were saying, you know, well, now we can go four times a week. Co companies were actually buying a stock and, putting in their kitchens and leaving for, for the employees that wanted to go to Garden Bar. They could just grab one and take it. And yeah. so how are you, with such thin margins, uh, when you say 2 to 5% on the first store, w would that include a salary for you as the, as the, the kind of person running the store? Mm, not, not really, not in the beginning now. I mean, the salary for the owners or for me in particular was very low throughout the acquisition. We, the, a lot of the labor, when we, when I, when I accounted for labor, it was for the labor at the store. So you, what you do is you have your food and you say, okay, a percentage of that is, you have a, if you have a salad, you see a percentage of that that costs the food and a percentage of that that costs the labor. So if you just take that alone, it is about 60 to 65% of the salad. So imagine for every dollar, 65 cents goes to food and labor, just the store labor, right? And then you take your rent, another 8 to 9%, so then you keep going down. So no, I did not pay myself for the first year and a half. And then I started getting a small amount uh, that, I, that I would pay myself, but really not a lot. Um, How did you I, find people to run the stores? Because you, you grew this business quite quickly uh -huh, and you obviously couldn't afford to pay, I'm assuming, those managers a, a king's ransom, but you would have to pay them modestly, wouldn't you? You do, you do, yeah. So this is an interesting thing that goes with the whole strategy of say, or how you actually build a company. The idea is I was very much focused on building my team at the stores. So in the beginning, what you do is you have what we call our garden chefs, and then you have your, your supervisors. And then we did have managers, but we would say, when we had, let's say with the first five, six stores, we would have two managers and then one manager would take three stores and then the other manager would take three stores. And then you start growing and you have more managers. At the end, at nine stores, each store had its own manager. And then the manager of the store, the general manager, uh, whatever, whatever you call them, but the, the one that owns the store. So then... I had an operations person that managed, managed all the managers, and then I was in corporate. Got but, it. How did, you, how did you fuel the growth from one to two, two to three? Like, how did you get the money to, to do that? Yeah. So I really follow the evolution of fundraising. You know, it's like the textbook evolution of fundraising. So the first store was uh, self-funded, as I mentioned, and I had a very small line of credit that I used, not a lot. And then second store, I got a very small SBA loan, which was personally guaranteed in addition to the leases. And mm -hmm. I had a supplement from fans and family. So I had friends and family who loaned me a money and it was a promissory note. Uh, and that's what funded the second store. When I had those two stores and I was able to prove the model with the kitchen that's supplementing, you know, the, the two stores, then I went for an equity round and I had a fundraise, which I brought in 18 investors 
for, and they brought in $500,000. And with $500,000, I was able to give them uh, all the way through store six. And no one knows how I did it. I don't know how I did it actually, but we did it. So we, um, so for the first round of investment, the equity round, these investors took 20% in the, of the company in equity. And then I used that money to fund through store six. And then from store six to store nine, and then the lease of the 10th, because we were about to build the 10th when we sold, I had an equity uh, a convertible note, sorry, not an equity, a convertible note round. And then I brought in another group of investors under a convertible note. So I had two groups of investors, the equity holders and the note holders. Can you describe and, what a convertible note is? Yes. So a convertible note is, so in my equity is easy, right? So you, you give money and you get a percentage of the company. A convertible note, what you do is you get money up front and you accrues interest and, and then you give a maturity, a maturity date for that convertible note. And when that note is, is due, the investors have the option to take the money that they, that they invested plus the accrued interest and then they convert into equity. But in the convertible note, we have terms, right? And the terms are usually you offer a discount and you also offer a, a valuation cap. And the reason for that is because we're giving these investors a motivation to give me the money right now and not two years from now. Because so if they give me the money right now and two years from now I do another equity raise, the guy who comes two years from now is going to pay a little bit of a more expensive price for the share than this convertible note holder because this convertible note holder gave me the money ahead of time. Does that make sense? It does indeed. When you did the first kind of institutional round, I'll use yes. quotes uh, of, of $500,000 to get the six stores. I'm not very good at math, but I'm getting it. $2.5 million valuation for That's 20%. Right. Is that right? <laughs> so how did you come up with the $2.5 million valuation? Um, <laughs> Yeah, like what was the what was the metric you were using to value the business? Well, the pre money valuation one was one seven five zero. Um, okay. So what plus we did the five hundred gets you to two, yeah. Yeah, the post money. So the way we came up with the pre money was basically roughly one x revenue of both stores. Okay. So if you took both stores for the year and, and just kind of did the one X revenue, that's how we came up with that. And then that's, that's how it sort of like the price panned out. But you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> that's a whole other podcast thing. There's a lot of negotiation. Like, you know, you talk to the lawyer and then this is it. And then there's the investor that so you have, a, there's a lead investor and the lead investor has their notes. So it's fundraising is an art in itself, I would say. Uh, and I learned a lot. I had no idea what I was doing. No idea, um, mm. but I learned a lot. And that's one of the things that I'm actually helping right now is, is people understand what it means. What do you think, what, what was the most surprising lesson you learned during that fundraising? I mean, you're, you're a savvy businesswoman. You've, you've, you've been involved in business consulting for quite some time. You yeah. run a successful company. Um, yet it sounds like there were lessons that you learned in that fundraising. I'd be curious to know kind of, as you look back, what was the most surprising lesson you learned about fundraising? I I did not I did not understand the terms of my note, uh, my convertible what, note. Well, what specific terms the didn't term. you understand? Um, you know, you understand the basic. You understand the twenty percent discount, and you're trying to understand your evaluation cap. But I didn't I didn't understand. Like for example, this is something that happened to me, which was the killer piece. Was that if my company got acquired prior to converting? these investors would be, um, would be uh, entitled to have two and a half X their investment. So wow. that was something I had no idea going in. And, and it, to no one's fault, I just, I don't know. I, I, I did not know what that meant. At the same time, when I did the convertible note, I didn't know when the sale was going to happen. I don't even know if a sale was going to happen. I just, and sometimes the sale is an opportunity. And so you have to weigh these things. Another thing I did not know is that 
I would not have gone for an equity round right off the bat. I would have started with a convertible note. Mm. I would also have, I would have planned better when to do the equity round. I would have started the convertible note. I would have plan- I would have looked at the maturity rate. I would have, I would have lined up my growth plan with investment maturity dates and all that. I didn't do that. I didn't know that the, the, the way that the, the investment uh, timeline flows should be in sync with your growth plan. I had my growth plan and I had these investors who gave me money. I was super excited. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, it's great. They love me. Um, but, and I knew I had to do it. And one thing for me too, John, is like when I told my investors, you know, I'm going to get this money and I'm going to deliver this. I, I knew I had to deliver exactly what I told them I was going to deliver. And I did. But I had no idea how that was playing out with the investment timeline. So that's one of those things that I would have gone back and I would have synced them up, if that makes any sense. It would make sense more when I talk about the, the, the deal in general, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, let's get to it because so you had the, 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 the $500,000 that got you to store six, Correct. for which you gave up 20%. Yes. And, and then you had these convertible notes. Yes. And one of the stipulations of the convertible notes was that in the event that you were acquired, they would get two and a half X their, Invest. their investment. If I were acquired before converting, right? Okay. I'm assuming so, that happened. So the convert, the convert, <laughs> this is the part that was fascinating, which I didn't know. <laughs> this is a, so the, the convertible note was uh, due um, a year and a half after I raised the money. So technically September of 2018 was when it was due. I was not into the acquisition process then. And so we requested, so the notes were going to automatically convert into equity because that's what happens. But at the time, um, you know, I didn't have a very good financial advice. One of the things I'm very good at financially savvy, but when you're running your own company, you need somebody. It's like if you're a therapist and it's good to have a therapy, like I needed somebody, but I didn't have anybody to bounce off. And I just said, okay, let's just extend this note. And we did. So we extended the note another year and then three months. And so we didn't convert. That's what I mean. We didn't convert mm-hmm. the note. We asked for an extension for conversion. And then as, you know, as fate happens, the whole thing with the acquisition, we got the offer only three months later. So again, there was a, there was a, a clause in the, in, the, in the term sheet, the term, the convertible note terms that said, if the company's acquired before converting, then these investors need to get two and a half X their investment. And because we extended the conversion, they would not convert it. So because we were doing an acquisition, that was what the term was. And when did you learn that that term was in the contract in a convertible note? Um, I learned right away because, well, not right away. When we were going through the term sheet and term sheet, the term sheet, of, the, the term sheet for the acquisition. So from Evergreen, get, from Evergreens, yeah. Okay. You get a, you get an LOI, right? You get a letter of intent, and then we're negotiating the terms of the term sheet. The one thing you have to think about is what we call the waterfall. How is the, how are the funds going to be distributed? <laughs> so that's when my attorney is like, oh, no, so, not so good news for you. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, so, yeah, so that's when we had to really kind of work through because depending on how the waterfall was going to happen, we had to, to negotiate our terms with the acquirers, with our with evergreens. So there was a lot of conversation between me and my, and my attorney and me, and we were discussing this and then and how we were going to go back to the buyers to negotiate the payments and all that. Um, so that's what, that was very tricky, John, because like I said, I learned a lot. This was my new, my, my first time doing this and I wouldn't do it the same, but I had a very peculiar situation because note holders, as you probably know, have liquidation preference, right? So these note holders have a liquidation preference and they are entitled to have two and a half X their investment. But in my case, 
the unit holders were the ones that had to approve the deal. So unit now holders, are, now are the, equity, the equity people. The, the, equity the original people, people that had yeah. the six. Yeah. So the unit holders had to approve the deal. The deal. But they're not going to get two and a half X their money. You see? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so wait a minute. What? Okay. So the, the unit holders, um, you gave up 20% of equity to the unit holders, why yeah. would they have to approve the acquisition? You still had the majority of the shares, didn't you? Because they were pre preferred, uh, preferred shareholders. And I that's see. Part okay. of, so they were a different class. I was common and they were preferred. <laughs> this is complicated, Anna. Oh, no, I know, I know <laughs> okay. you. Okay, so, so these unit Sorry. holders are the ones who put in the first 500K. They've got a class of shares which gives them priority over correct exactly so they get priority so the class of shares so so the unit hold this is like a total finance lesson right right okay so imagine that so yeah so your preferred shareholders they i'm common so they have they have preference over me to get the funds back okay? to get their 500 grand back correct yes with the return but, or or just their 500 grand back well, they get their $500,000 back for sure. But if there was enough for a return, they'll get the return. Because what happens is you pay all your debt, debt holders first. So you have all your debts paid first. And then what's left is then distributed to the unit holders. They get their amount, the common get their amount, and then everybody else shares whatever is rest. So they get their this first This is what you're describing as a waterfall, right? Exactly. It's a waterfall. And I... Learn how to dance on that one. That was like one of those things where as things are happening, you're like, gosh, I knew nothing about this, you know, and it's a total different perspective now, but amazing lesson. Amazing okay, so, lesson. So the, 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 let's go, let's go through it. So you've got the convertible note holders who have a, or have loaned you some money to get from six stores to 10 stores. Correct. But, and there's a, a, a a coupon or a percentage of uh, that they're getting for their money. That is something that they essentially don't take, but when the note converts, they then get their That's return. Correct. It's an interest. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And an they interest. can roll that into equity. That's correct. So they and have a percentage interest and then when that accrues and then it becomes part of the total money. And then when, yeah. Exactly. How much money, how much did you have in convertible notes? I had $1.1 million in convertible notes. Wow. So two and a half times, that's a big nut. Exactly. Okay. So two exactly. and a half. Yeah. 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 But also remember, there is an interesting piece to that. Convertible note, the one, 1.1 1. 1 million, they also, they funded store, you know, stores seven to 10, but they also had to fund the operational needs, which most people don't like because restaurants are an interesting industry, right? If you, if you are an investor and you give me money, you want to see stores because you like to say, look at Grandmar, look at them. They have 10 stores. It's great. Investors love to see stores. So it was a very tough thing for me to convince them that, hey, you know, stores cannot run on their own. Like I need to, I need to create supply chain. I have to have a commissary kitchen. I have to buy trucks. I have to buy refrigerated trucks. So you got technology. There's a lot of infrastructure expenses that is very hard to sell to an investor team. They, they, they don't like to fund operations. So the convertible note holders were willing to help me fund operations. Uh, the equity holders were not so keen on that. So that, that's a little bit of that. So I appreciate they come later in the game and they also come later in the fact that some note holders were funding me all the way through the end, meaning they're taking more risk because as you're going through, their risk is higher. Um, so there's a lot of Sometimes there's not an understanding, you know, the equity holders feel like they're entitled, but because they are the seed money, which I appreciate more than, you know, and by the way, I love all my investors to death and I just, I'm so grateful for all of them, but they, they, they play like they're like in the playground, you know, no, I'm better than you. No, I'm better than you because I came in early. No, you came in early. It's, it's like, okay, you guys play in a sandbox. I'm going to go run the company and we'll talk later, you know, a little bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. So how did, how did you sort all this out? 
A lot of negotiation. So again, just you have to take think about the landscape of the company. You also have to think about, you know, we had nine locations, another one coming. Um, we're in Portland, Oregon, which is a little interesting because top line revenue in Portland is not the industry average in the country. So even though we were doing really well for our state, if you compare Portland, Oregon to California or New York or even Seattle, it's usually 30% less. By that, the reason I say that is because to give you perspective, uh, when I created, I, I put the number 10 in my head as when I hit 10 stores, I was going to figure out a way to decide what to do for the next round of growth. And I decided that I wanted to get an uh, amount of money to buy out my investors because all my investors were in the angel category. I didn't have really institutional investors. And so if you are in the angel category, most people who are probably listening know what that means. You know, an angel investor comes in, they love your story, they trust you, they, they, they believe in you, they give you 50 grand, they don't bother you, you go run the company and then, you know, you wanna, I wanted to make them proud and I want everyone to get their money back. But then once you graduate from angel investing, then you go to maybe institutional money, then you go to private equity, right? And then with private equity money, what they do is they will infuse a lot more money, but they will also work with you to go from point A to point B. You're not doing this alone. You're not, you know, so there's a little bit of a different mentality. The reason I say that is because when I had in my head, when I hit 10 stores, I want to find either the private equity money or an acquisition to buy out my investors. So that's what, that was the trigger for me. So did you have the rights to buy them out? Like how would that have worked? How would the unit, did you have the rights to just turn around to the, the unit holders and buy them, buy them out? Well, if we had, a, if, okay. So when I say buy them out, I mean, offer them an exit. So mm -hmm. yeah, you always have the right to, you know, to offer the investors an exit, right? So if I, let's say that I had gone to private equity and we decided that, okay, now we're going to take this from 10 to 100, okay, and they come back, they would probably offer them an exit. And I would say, yes, you have the right to do that. And they, they have the right to say no, but very rarely a, a, an angel is going to say, no, I'm not going to take my money back, right? Unless they want to buy back in, which then could have been an option, but I didn't, it was not the option that we offered them. Okay. With the preferred note holders, different mm -hmm. than the unit holders, did you, if, when the preferred note came due, I'm assuming that you would have had the option to pay their yield, pay the coupon yes, and pay I them did. out directly. Yeah. But, but that option was, I didn't have the money to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So did you consider, so you had this acquisition offer from Evergreens, which mm -hmm. it sounds like a, a similar company. We tell, tell me a little bit about Evergreen. Yeah. So this is an interesting piece. So Evergreens is a similar company. They started in Seattle by two incredible people that um, no longer with the company, but I, that I love to death. And what happened is that, so they started in Seattle, same, same idea, same response, the city embraced. And at a point in time when I was looking at my expansion growth, you know, our, our next step would be to go to a second, to a second market. And so we started con contemplating going to Seattle because geographically we're so, sure. we're so close. They were doing the same, actually. They were like, okay, well, we want to go to second market. We were, we, at the time, we had very similar number of stores. They started growing faster, but they, at the time that we were thinking about this, this was about 2017-ish. Uh, I, I was actually, uh, one of the founders of Evergreens reached out to me via LinkedIn. Uh, and said, hey, you know, we hear that you guys are doing really well over there. You know, we're thinking about going down. You guys are coming up. Do you want to chat? So we started a conversation almost two years prior to the actual acquisition. And it was one of those, let's get to know each other better. What are you doing? What are your values? What, is, what are your goals? And we became very, we started to get to know each other a lot over the course of about two years uh, and we, we were always talking about what the possibilities would be for us to get together 
And the reason for that, John, is because Portland is a small town still, and we have a very limited amount of people here. So the idea was, okay, Evergreens, you come, we we're gonna lose revenue, we're gonna lose market share because right now Garden Bar pretty much had the entire market share. Yeah, you had the market. Yeah. They would come in, yeah, they would come in and take a little bit, but the honesty is that we were both not gonna be able we were not gonna have enough density to, to make both chains successful. So we thought if we bring it together, now Evergreens Garden Bar together, we would be the fourth largest solid chain in the nation, you know, behind Sweet Green and a, a few others and Chopped. And so we thought this would be a much better way to put the Northwest and have a Northwest brand as opposed to for us trying to compete for, you know, customers that are just not here because we don't have that density. Sure, sure. So um, I honestly felt that that would be a much better uh, option for Garden Bar because also Evergreens was much, they were very highly capitalized. I mean, they were very well funded. And honestly, I thought, oh my goodness, for me to compete, I would have to really go for a really high money for private equity. And so which I, I could have gone, but and I felt, so, yeah. So with nine, when you raised the first round to the unit holders, you use one times revenue as the sort of yes. valuation metric. What was the valuation metric in your mind as you start to have these conversations with Evergreens? Are you still in the kind of one times revenue? Yeah, a little bit, yes. Because it's typical for what we do. Um, yeah. Restaurants are typical that way. And, and honestly, it's a very, very hard industry, especially now. You know, you're probably hearing all the ones that are closing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, sure. it's, it's a tough one because it's capital intensive. The amount of money you have to put in to build a restaurant is insane. Um, but we had the brand, which was very valuable. And we created a lifestyle brand with what we did you know people when we, we thought about garden bar there was a lot that we did for uh no when we invested very little in marketing it was all uh community engagement and partnerships and and and, and creating you know uh unity with people who who could promote our brand so we had that brand but still uh, the the one X is usually where we are at when we go to restaurants yes and so what was your reaction when evergreens uh, made you an offer? Well, it wasn't so much because I had to go and ask them to put the ring on my finger. So the way it worked is we're dating, 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 dating. I'm like, okay, you know, when is this going to happen? When is this going to happen? When I decided that I was going to pursue a suitor because I thought, okay, I had two options, right? So I'm either going to get private equity money or I'm going to get a suitor to acquire us. And mm -hmm. I was going both sides. And I was talking to private equity companies, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, different places. And I also was going to start pursuing a suitor. So what I did is I made a trip to Seattle and I met with those guys and I said, hey guys, this is what's going to happen. I am going to start pursuing a suitor. If you guys are, are real about this, you got to make an offer. And so I did, I did sign a few NDAs with different companies that uh, I told them, I said, I am talking to different companies. And because they were coming here and they didn't want to lose that opportunity, right? And also they didn't want to come here and then face a national chain all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So this was October and we signed a, then they sent me an LOI kind of sort of like maybe a few weeks later. And then by December 28th, we had signed the term sheet. Got so it, it was and about what, a three month, yeah. What was your reaction to the LOI? I mean, I was happy to see it happen actually because it was, it was in the making, right? I'm like, okay, we're talking about this. We're going to do it. Um, and that's when the fun starts because then you don't know how to negotiate. I mean, I, I couldn't negotiate in, in behalf of my, of, of, my, of, my, of my investors, right? You can't because I'm too much into this company and I wouldn't be the best person to negotiate it. So... When the LOI came, I had to work with other people to help me assess the deal and 
then start negotiating on behalf of the investors and the company and me and all that. But I, I was not the one who could do, I was always with them and we were discussing it. But when the negotiating started, I had to step aside and let one of the most amazing people help me with it. And he was, um, he was one of our investors and they especially do M and A's all the time. And I was very lucky because I was going to engage an M and A specialist to help me through this. Mm -hmm. But one of our investors, he, they are amazing, brilliant. And this man, his name is Sam. He, he helped me through the whole thing and he is unbelievably incredible. And he did the so whole thing. So Sam was a preferred shareholder or a, a unit? He was a no, they were a note holder. They were a note holder. Right. How yeah. did you get comfortable with the idea that Sam was looking after your interests and not just looking after his interests? I mean, well, because obviously he was conflicted, right? He wanted to get, as a preferred shareholder, he wanted it. Well, as a note holder. Excellent. Well, as a note holder, you know, because there's really not a lot of levers there. It's not like... He, he was trying to get, he was trying to get what was the best option that we possibly could have. Right. So we were not like, well, first of all, we were not, we don't, we didn't have a lot of cash. I mean, there was a lot of issues. There was a lot of reasons why I need it. So, so here was the thing I needed to get more funding if I were not going to go through the acquisition, I was going to have to raise again, right? To, to help us with 10 store, to help us with, with all the operations. So there were some limitations on how much we could have. What Sam was helping me negotiate is what are the terms of the purchase? You know, when do we make the first payment? What's the first payment going to look like? How, what are the terms later? How do we pay? So he did a fantastic job working with their board to get these terms negotiated. And then I had an attorney who was in the back end, like working with me and helping me understand and helping me draft the documents and all that, that stuff that needs to happen. So... Got it. So, so if I'm understanding this correctly, there's a few parallel negotiations going on. It, it, tell me if I'm getting this right. But your negotiation, you're negotiating with Evergreens yes. to maximize the value you can get and, and, and get the best possible terms. And at the same time, you're trying to negotiate with the note holders to reduce their expectations on the two and a half X on a liquidity bet. You're saying, come on guys, like exactly. that's going to wash out most of the proceeds. Yes. And, and, and what possible motivation would they have to play ball? In particular, those uh, note holders, why would they, why would they play be ball. willing to, yeah, yeah. What would, what would be in it for them? Yeah. To, Excellent question. So first of all, you got it completely right. Here we are, we are negotiating with the buyers, but I had to personally negotiate with the investors to, to work with our note holders to take a lower return, which they did. Their, their motivation was a quick and early exit. Okay, because a lot of the investors are savvy enough to understand that staying longer in the game doesn't mean a better return. And if now they're listening to this, and hopefully they will, they're probably very grateful because after COVID, they're like, yeah. yes, gosh, this was that. the yeah. best thing ever. But, the, but their motivation to play ball is when you're an angel and you have the opportunity to recapture your funds with some return, then you can use that to the next one. First of all, a lot of them love this game of investing. It gives them some money to invest someone else. It gives you this exit feel. So they're not, they don't, they don't want to be there for the long term. And a lot of them don't think, oh, okay, well, hold on. If we stay another three years, maybe you're going to get more money later. They, they are savvy enough to understand the restaurant world and also – I mean, just if you look in Portland alone, uh, well, not a lot of companies here. I mean, we had one company that got acquired, one uh, ha hamburger chain that got acquired, but there's not a lot in the f and world here in our area. So they, they know these, these things and they knew that 
this was the opportunity to get the deal done. So I basically said, and you know, I mean, I have to be honest with them. Like you take the deal. Well, if the deal doesn't happen, I don't know what's going to happen. So the risk is higher. Um, and they, they understood, they understood that I, there's another thing too. It's important to understand that I stretch myself thin a lot. And because I was so I'm focused, getting that sense on it. <laughs> Huh? I'm what getting that? that sense. I you was just saying, I'm sense. getting that sense that you tend to stretch yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I did not build. I did not build a a very large corporate team. It was me and another person, my beloved Nicole, who was my, you know, left hand, right hand, my octopus. But the two of us did everything. And and when you're running a company with 150 employees and there's two people in a cockpit, I mean, it is insane. I was CEO, CFO, COO, and I was, you know, behind the line trying to help out with salads. So I didn't do a good job uh, creating the infrastructure for the C-suite because I was focused on creating the best team for the stores. So... What happened was I was not, if I didn't build a C-suite, if I didn't build a, you know, if I didn't have a real good COO next with me, I don't know that we could go to that expansion that I was hoping for. And to get a kick, you know, a great COO, I would have to be able to pay a lot of money, right? So I would have to raise money for that, for that particular position. So my investors are very aware that I was doing it all by myself and there was so much I was going to be able on my own. So the note holders, who are these these people who had the two and a half times, uh, you know, their money clause if there was a liquidity event, they were motivated. And and you you said the downside was, look, you guys could take a lesser amount um, and kind of get out quickly, or you could really cling to this clause, and uh, a couple of things might happen. One, I might go bankrupt. Two, I could get a private equity company to basically refinance the company and then just basically pay you guys your preferred return or your, your note uh, when the note uh, matures. Matures. And or, you're going to get a lot less or you could take a lesser than the two and a half times. That's correct. Yeah. Another option. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So That so was the sort of how, conversation you were having? The conversation was exactly that. You can take, you know less than two and a half. Or if I get a private equity, it's exactly what you said. If I get a private equity to invest in a company that is considered a liquidity event, you convert. And when they convert, they would get a fraction of what they were going to get at that multiple, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it wouldn't make any sense for us to continue on and get somebody else to invest. So financially, they were much better off accepting that multiple, because if we had to convert them, they would get a lot less than your original. Got it. And, and were the note holders acting as one group? Did they have one representative that was essentially acting as the spokesperson or were you herding cats and trying to get all of them to kind of agree at the same time? No, no, we had uh, two, what we call the lead ones. So even though there are multiple, there's always one or two that put a lot more money and these two, which Sam was one of them, they sort of represented the group. Got and it. then they also took a couple of uh, two of the group of the unit holders and they kind of had a little committee. Ah, uh, interesting. That's the okay. best way to play nice with each other and how that, so the committee of investors from both groups talked and discussed what would be the best way for them to divide the money. Because the committee, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, the unit holders these preferred shareholders, the first round, yes. they had veto over, yes. over accepting the deal. Yes. So they had uh, the cards in their hand as well. So they weren't going to accept the deal that paid out two and a half times for these like guys who roll, F, roll okay. in in the last yes. minute. You get it. They wouldn't. They, wouldn't. Oh, they, were not excited. they were not excited about approving a deal where those guys got two and a half and they didn't, right? So they were not excited. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so there was that negotiation. <laughs> Anna, I mean, how much, I'm curious to know to what extent this was a, a dollars and cents negotiation 
where it was simply just you know what's you know what's the best way to get us the maximum return or if if your personal equity your relationship equity with either of the two shareholder groups did that play a role were did, were you able to say, hey, come on, guys, I, you know, I've been working at this for X number of years. I put my life on the line. I need to, you know, I need to get some return as well. Like, did that relationship equity play a role or was it totally dollars and cents? Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, totally. 100%. I just, I want to tell you the truth because it's not going to be a fun truth. Uh, I gave up everything for them. And that was because I, in my mind, they provided me with the opportunity to build something that it was everything I always wanted to build. And I learned and I am talking to you and I am now helping others. That to me is priceless. And I created something really meaningful for this town. And, and so my first goal was to get everyone else paid first even if there was not going to be anything left for me. I was 100% comfortable with that. Because also, if you have to remember, I had a lot of debt. The company had debt that I was personally guaranteeing. Aside from the, 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 aside from sure. the lease, this, yeah. yeah, we had we had one conventional loan of 300. We had, you know, credit cards. We had things that I, it was all me. And those guys were going to be all paid because there's also debt holders. So all the debt load was going to be paid out. My credit score was going to go up because my credit score was so bad. I could not rent a house just to give an idea how bad it was. Like I got refused. I could not rent homes for two years. I got, de I got denied. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable that you can own a company and, and you have management companies deny you for renting houses, which wow. I had to plead to owners. It's a whole other story. But my point is I knew that I was going to go back to a beautiful credit score, which I have now. I have an incredible legacy that I'm leaving behind. So to answer your question, I, 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 yes, I put a lot of heart and soul on this, but I loved every minute of it and I, I learned a lot from it and I got a lot from it. So financially, I decided that I wanted to make my investors whole first. And that was very important to me. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I didn't do that. So the way that the deal ended up getting structured is that we were going to get a chunk of money um, up front at the closing and then an earn out after two years, which then would get take care of everyone and I would get a payout later, right? Um, so the first closing amount got distributed to all the investors the way I wanted it. But now we are trying to figure out what's going to happen with COVID because there's no stores open. So the stores oh are now closed. So, so, so that's an unfortunate piece. And that has nothing to do with the deal. And it has nothing to do with, with them. And there's nothing to do with me. It has to do with life. And unfortunately, they had to close all the stores. And um, I don't know if they're going to reopen. And unfortunately, I don't even know if they're going to come back. And so chances are we won't get, I don't, I'm pretty sure we probably won't get the earn out. Um, but, it, you know, I, 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 it's okay. I mean, I'm, it's not, it's not okay. It's just one of those things where these, these things happen and I have to keep moving on and build the next thing, you know? So I'm motivated to continue on and building the next thing, but things like that happen. They really do. And it was not on the cars. We were on target to get that earn out. And it was the target for the earn out was really achievable. We actually negotiated a target of the earn out back and forth so many times. So when I agreed for to the metrics for the earn out, I knew it was doable. It was almost like, of course, we're going to get this earn out. I mean, you know, the stores are going to be great. They're going to have operational efficiencies. We're going to be fine. Everything is great. <laughs> And to be clear, when you say we are going to get this earn out, uh, who was in line to to get the proceeds of the earn out? Was it just you or were 
any of the original shareholders yeah, also going to be compensated? Yeah, yeah. So the shareholders, I'll say this. So the invest, the unit holders got a hundred percent of their money back, but no, everybody got, everybody got pretty much their money back. The note holders got just a scotch, maybe. 95% of their money back, but they really didn't lose a lot. And then the rest was all going to come in the year now. So all the, mm. the extras for everybody, all the, the returns, including you, including me, all yeah. the returns for the investors were going to come at the earn out. And everybody was comfortable with that because it was a year and it was, it was one, it was 2020 and we were going to get it into early 2021 um but then we closed the store the stores had to be mandatorily closed uh there was no way to continue with covid so wow. it's a bummer it's a real bummer they're still closed because we're still not open here in oregon so yeah it's a bummer wow yeah right i know hmm. <laughs> you should write a book kid <laughs> <laughs> I, I, am. You. <laughs> I am i know it's a lot to take in isn't it i, I know. know i'm like i'm like i need a drink it's like a <laughs> tired i'm like oh my gosh you look so tired am i like exhausting you um but you know no i just look I, I, it's a, yeah we, i know i know what a what a story so look if you were advising another entrepreneur and you know who who maybe had a a business and they thought okay i'm going to i'm going to raise some money mm-hmm. um you know what what might you share with them what experience might you do differently what would you say you would do differently if you could go way back obviously you can't control the pandemic but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but but maybe there's something you would do differently what what would you say that is well i would definitely strategize the fundraising differently. Um, now that I understand what it does, how it works, you know, what's the time frame to give it back? Like what the angels are expecting, the different types of funding, things that I had no idea. I was learning every single thing as I was doing it. So the 2.5 I- times liquidity preference that you had in the note holders that was something you, you glossed over. Did your lawyer not point that out when you signed that? Or like, how did that happen that, that it was sort of a surprise to you when you got the Evergreens offer? I was working with a financial advisor at the time that was, there was a little bit of an issue there. Um, And it it is nothing but my fault and I, I'm not gonna. Okay. So um, he ended up, he, it's almost embarrassing, but what happened was he was a financial advisor and he decided, he decided to be an investor as well, mm. but I trusted him with my heart. I really did. And when you're doing everything alone and you have somebody, I, I am, I'm very trustworthy and I, I, I think people have the best interest. Um, when he created, when he worked on this no terms, my attorney at the time, which was not the same attorney that did the deal, he tried to bring me in and, and, and advise me on that. And he said, I feel like there is a conflict of interest here and I need to point this out. And I said, no, he's here. I trust him. I trust him with my heart. And I know that he's doing what's best for me. So this attorney felt really uncomfortable um, and he, he was trying to advise me. And honestly, John, I, I did not, I didn't believe, I thought, I thought, no, this man has absolutely the best interest at heart for me. The, the, the needless to say, the relationship deteriorated a year and a half later, and it was a terrible sort of a breakup. But I, at the time I, I believed and I trusted. So yes, did I gloss over? Yes, because I had him helped me write these, and he did. He told me that was the right thing to do. But also, in his defense, 
I guess he didn't know there was going to be an acquisition before an equity, right. uh, an equity event because in his mind at the time, we were going to pursue an equity event. So I don't think it's all his fault. I don't think he was like there to get me because he's not, he's not the one who also pursued the acquisition. I pursued the acquisition, right? So I'm, 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 I'm very big on taking ownership and I, I own this mistake because when I was very, very conflicted with what I need to do, I was giving people the responsibilities that I should have had. So one thing I would have done differently, absolutely I would have learned the terms of financing. And, and now I overcame that fear, right? Because uh, I, I understand when people are so afraid of numbers. I know how some, some founders don't want to know about financials, and I'm always so shocked by it because I feel like if you don't know how to read your numbers, you can't run a company, right? I am a finance person, uh, so I understand and I'm comfortable with that. But I did have a little bit of fear of the, the fundraising piece, and I had to overcome that. So now, looking back, I would never – sign or, or create a term, you know, sheet for my, for potential investors without knowing every single possibility. But I'm going to mention something I mentioned earlier in the interview, which is what I would have done and what I would do and I would advise every entrepreneur to do is try to understand the timeline of these, the note holders, for example, you know, when is maturity, what are the terms and see how that syncs up with your plan of action to grow. Because you wanna make sure those are lined up. Because let's say that you know you need to raise some more money, but this is gonna convert, how do we do it? So we have to, to really uh, put these two timelines together and see how they coincide or not, and then create a good strategy. A good strategy is everything for most entrepreneurs should know that. Um, it's a, it's a sort of like a, what's the big picture plan? And then how we're going to fund that big picture plan. So you, you mentioned the aligning the, uh, you know, the, the, the investment path with yes, your, your with growth, plan growth sure. path. Yes. Oh, yes. I, have to, I have to ask, what about those leases you personally signed in stores that are now closed? What, what happens to those? Um, well, so for the, from the 10 leases, I was able to, to get um, about six of them, I didn't. I was able to get out of my personal guarantee. Four right. of them are still there, um, and I'm still negotiating. I don't know. We're talking. I'm talking to the buyers right now to find out what they're going to be doing. But there is a clause in our purchase agreement that they that um, they that indemnifies me, like that they you know okay. something happen they are going to take it so there is some protection there yeah of course i mean i wouldn't have done that but it, it's just too unsettling right it's too unsettling and i know that every restaurant owner right now is trying to deal with that same issue um so we'll see with covid what the what the response is going to be but it, it's unsettling and i feel it's very sad to see the, the what's happening to the food and beverage you know industry especially in our town because for portland you know, the restaurant, the restaurant world is very much at the soul of the city. Sure. So it's hard to see so many people just going on there right now. You know, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. We're still not open. So I don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So hopefully there's going to be some resolution there, but I don't have that. I don't know what that is yet. Yeah. Yeah. So many things seem so up in the air for so many people right now. And Oh, it's hard. It very is very much hard. It's very hard. Anna, where, I, I'm so grateful for you sharing your story with so much humility. Where, where can people learn about you? What are you doing now? What's, what's the, you know, where, where can people learn about what you're up to now? Thank you. Yeah. So interesting because, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the interview, I was a, a business consultant for 12 years in San Francisco before I moved to Portland. So after the, after the, the acquisition, I, I sort of like slipped back into that role again and been helping companies. Um, but what I want to do and what I'm doing now, actually, I started a company called uh, 360 Advisory. And it's, there's a website that's 360-advisory.com. And basically what we do is we work with early stage founders, you know, people who we have 
concept stage founders, people who are trying to get their companies off the ground, but people who just started uh, are getting to market. And then we work with them until they grow to about, you know, two to three million. Uh, and then once once they're in two to three million, then we take the training wheels off and then they can just go and, and find uh, other companies. But the idea is to find the best way to fundraise if they need to be fundraised. Like sometimes, you know, there is this idea right now that everyone has to get investment. We don't necessarily do that. Like you can mm. try to find ways to bootstrap and not have to get investment. So I'm trying to work with everybody to find out what's the best path forward to get your company, you know, get to market and how to grow it to one or two million. And there's also to understand that there are there are milestones in between, right? So before we get to the one or two million, how do we get from zero to 200, you know? And then once we get from 200, then how do we get to the million? So designing plans and working on execution is what I'm doing. And I'm doing that in different ways. I mean, of course I do one-on-one, -on -one, but I am much more inclined to work in, in peer group formats because it is a very good way of getting people to go forward by working with each other and learning from their peers. So that's what we've been working on. And I'm actually working with two of my investors, um, which is MISO, which is an incredible organization that I recommend people uh, look up, and also Thai Angels. And those are two uh, two groups that invested in Garden Bar and now I joined the board of those two groups and I'm working with their portfolio companies and their clients to help them forward. So it's been a really awesome. amazing experience. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming you're on LinkedIn. Um, I am on LinkedIn. Yes. We'll just let people know it's, it's on yeah. a shout, but it's, yeah. uh, it's spelled -U -D. a bit differently. It's C H A U D. Um, yeah. It's, it's so. hot in French, by the way. <laughs> it really is. I'm not kidding. I get that yeah. a lot, but it is like I always say: if you don't know how to spell it, look at your Starbucks cup. It says "hot" in French. Just take that name, copy it. There you go. You have got yeah. it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So LinkedIn, the website. Um, I'm so grateful for you sharing some time on it. Thank it was, you. Uh, I appreciate amazing. the call. That that was amazing to have this conversation. Thank you, and thank you for letting me talk freely. I appreciate it very much. Oh my gosh, it was great. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you, and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at Facebook.com slash Built to Sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. -L 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 -L. Thanks for listening.